Okay, welcome back, everybody. I hope you got coffee on me in your kitchen or wherever you need to get coffee. Um, hopefully, you are at the right session. This is the how to build products and ecosystems for, uh, I'm sorry, how to build a connected product for the home. More on the enterprise side, Stacy has that session. So if you want to be in that one, just click the sessions button on the left hand side of Hopin. You can switch over. I won't be offended. I promise it's okay. Um, but this makes sense. Stacy's really into the enterprise side of things where I've been doing uh, or covering the smart home for a better part of a decade now uh, before IoT was even coined, I guess. So um, hopefully you are in the right spot. Mm -hmm. And before I introduce everybody on our panel, I just want to say this is hopefully going to be more of a roundtable so that you don't have to hear my silliness. Instead, you're hearing great thoughts from our panelists. And you can also, and I think this is kind of unique and I hope people take advantage of this, you can actually request to ask them a question. You'll be on audio and video when you do that. I will approve that. Um, hopefully we keep it to topic or I'll have to like kind of moderate that and delete somebody. I don't want to delete anybody, maybe my kids, but that's a whole other issue. So, um, so I will try and talk as little as possible. But before we really get started, I would like to go around and have everybody introduce themselves. Um, maybe just tell everybody a little bit about who you are, where you're from, and uh, some of the products or product lines that you've worked with in the past. Uh, we'll start with Jonathan Cobb, please. Hi. Um, good afternoon, everyone. Um, or good morning, depending where you are. Uh, Jonathan Cobb, CEO of Ayla Networks. We're an IoT platform company, and we have... Uh, we've got about a hundred, just over a hundred customers and, and they do connected devices. Everything from the smallest is, is probably a connected baby stock that measures blood oxygen level. And the largest is, um, you know, industrial boilers. We've got everything in between through coffee machines, kitchen appliances. So we've got a fair bit of experience, uh, helping, helping folks get to market. Excellent. Uh, Michelle, we had you on a previous panel, but if you could just reintroduce yourself. Sure. Um, hi, I'm Michelle Turner. I run the smart home ecosystem for Google. Um, started out at Nest about five years ago, where I was running actually all the software product management, moved into hardware, uh, was running our camera product line and um, doorbell and got out Nest Secure, our, our home security system, and uh, then moved into Google proper to take over running the ecosystem. So um, I have the fun job of actually working with all of our, our uh, connected home partners and um, getting them to connect with the Google Assistant. So, Excellent, excellent. Yeah. And Johan. Hi, guys. I am uh, responsible for product marketing for home and consumer IoT at Silicon Labs. So um, at Silicon Labs, we provide the wireless building blocks for all your smart home devices. And I'm actually sitting here in Copenhagen. Uh, I just found a spot uh, in one of my developer colleagues' desk with a little bit more interesting background. Um, but uh, we're the company behind the the the, the works with event also, um, mm -hmm. and uh, we provide uh, building blocks for C-Wave, Zigbee, Bluetooth, Wi-Fi, and all the different wireless protocols and technologies that uh, enable the IoT uh, in the home. Excellent. And I don't even want to know what's going on behind you there, Johan. Like, I thought I, thought I had a, like a crazy test bench and all for my PCs and my Arduinos and Pi projects, but I don't know what that is. Uh, all right. So let's see. I'm going to add Matt Van Horn and have Matt introduce himself. I don't see him on camera yet. He's there he there is. is. Hey, Matt, if you could just tell everybody who you are, where you work, and what you've worked on. Hi, uh, my name is Matt, and I'm one of the co-founders and CEO of June. We make the, the June Smart Oven, which is currently sold out in the madness of, of COVID-19. And we also have a partnership with Weber. We power their operating system on the new Weber Smoke Fire Grill. Outstanding. And Andy, I see you just got back in. Awesome. If you could just introduce yourself and, and tell folks where you're at. Andy, can you hear me? I hear Andy typing. 
He has no audio. Uh oh. Uh, let's see if we can get that resolved. Andy, I'm going to let you try and figure that out. I'm not quite sure what the issue might be. So I would say maybe just um, drop out of the session completely, close your browser, and come back in. Maybe that will help us. Yeah, actually, that's correct. I could hear you typing, Andy. Mm -hmm. I think he cannot hear us. I think that, that is the problem. So everybody's trying to help. <laughs> All right. Well, we'll get started while Andy tries to get that resolved. Got to love live events online. Thank you, pandemic. <laughs> All right. So for everybody who is in the audience, um, this is a chance to hear from product managers and developers uh, about best practices, challenges, and so on. And again, it will be more of a uh, a uh, roundtable discussion, and I'll try and stay out of the way. But just to kick it off, um, what I'd like to, to do is maybe start with some of the challenges that you all have, faces, have faced. Rather. Um, and in fact, if you could, and you're all from different areas, backgrounds, and companies, and product lines, so I expect different answers, but what's the biggest challenge for connected home products that you've had to resolve or tried to resolve, and how did you mitigate them, whether it's security, privacy fears, integrations, customer education about features or, or setup, whatever it might be. If you had to pick one, what could it be? No audio. Can you all hear me okay? Mm -hmm. All right. Yeah. Oh, it, it, are you having a hard time picking just one challenge because there's so many? Yeah, there's a lot. <laughs> <laughs> I, was like, yeah. I hear you. I hear you. Well, let's let's focus on on one that maybe we haven't discussed in some of the other um, discussions, and I would say privacy fears. And I know we're trying to make um, a move towards as much localization as possible to help mitigate that. But what other aspects could we tackle there, or what other ways can we uh, bridge that that challenge or that gap in the meantime? Well, I, I, I can yeah. start with this one. Um, so. You know, with with June, so we we put a camera in your oven. We um, and one of the the first things that we we say when you're setting up your June oven, say, would you like to share your data with us? Uh, this this data will help us improve the ecosystem for everyone. And um, with that, users have a choice right off the bat. And so if you say no, we've created this experience where you kind of have the best in class food recognition, cook programs, et cetera, but it's not able to get better. But we've kind of have over-engineered and been thoughtful about how to create almost this offline experience. So you can take your June oven and as long as you have electricity, you can go camping in the woods with it. People do this, RVs, et cetera. So you don't need Wi-Fi to recognize your, your foods automatically and run those cook programs. But a lot of the magic of June is the software updates, the over-there updates, and so it's crazy how many people opt to share their data with us because they wanna make the ecosystem better. So for example, if I only have a small amount of photos of a new food and I'm trying to add a category for food recognition, let's go with like a whole lobster, right? Um, which we don't have a cook program for now. We have lobster tails, but a whole lobster cook program, right? If I only have one photo or 10 photos of whole lobsters, that doesn't do me any good. If I have thousands of photos of whole lobsters, then I can start to do interesting things. And so the community almost feels that there's this benefit to sharing this data with us. And so it's up to us. And the challenge is how do we create value in exchange for agreeing to share their data with us? I, I totally agree with Matt. I think there's, um, uh, there's gotta be a value exchange. And I think with um, June, you're able to make that really clear. Uh, I'd say with Google, there's we face just bigger privacy challenges, and we are super, super committed to privacy. Um, I, w my team of PMs would tell you that we spend an unbelievable time with privacy and, and legal trying to make sure that we're doing the right thing, because especially with the ecosystem, there's so much data um, that can come through. And uh, somebody noted this, uh, Rob did in the, in the notes, it's about transparency, right? So we try to persuade, we put forward our privacy commitments. Um, we try to make it really clear where your data goes and what we do with it, which Matt, it sounds like you do with June. It's like, I can, we can make your product better, right? Which is also the same thing with Google, but there's a lot more concern because we're big. 
um, on where the data goes. So we've we've made sure, for example, that um, none of your smart home data uh, goes like as a consumer, none of your data gets shared into our ad server. There was a lot of concern about that early on, like, oh my gosh, you're gonna start, uh, you, you bought a, a, a June oven and connected it, and now you're going to start sending me, you know, ads for competitive products and things like that. So we, none of that goes into the ad server. And then you're also able to control, um, see what's going on and control it through the My Activity tab on Google. So I, it's, I think different companies face different problems, but I do think um, Rob in the, in the comments uh made a really good point. It's about transparency. People want to have control of their data. They want to know what you're doing with your data. Um, and if and they want to be able to take it back and limit what you get per what you're doing, Matt, if, um, if they're not happy sharing it. And so I think that's where we have to go as an industry. And I think um, security, uh, you know, you can't really talk about privacy without talking about security. Because obviously mm -hmm. it doesn't really matter what you're doing with the data if the, if the data is insecure. And I think one of the one of the challenges we see a lot with you know a lot of our, our customers are, are smaller manufacturers of products is they they have to get themselves over the hump that okay connecting a product is not going to produce um, uh, is not going to be a big security problem for their customers um, and then I think they have to be transparent with what are we doing with the data and why are we collecting data um, on the privacy thing I think as a as a kind of um, something we've seen recently is the you know the UL Certification, I think, is a because having that third-party stamp on a device to say, you know, this is certified at this level of security, I think, is really, really good for for consumers to see, so they can have some confidence um, that not only is the, the company they're buying the, the the product from doing the right things with data, but they're also not, uh, but they're also being very um, uh, sensitive about security around it as well. I will also add on to that, like. Um, uh, we used to argue the reason for, for joining smart home ecosystems was to not have 10 different apps to interface with your different products or services. But it's also an argument of joining an ecosystem to ensure that all the systems in your home and all the data is being managed mm -hmm. in the same secure way. Right. And I see Andy's back and I think you can hear us. I figured it out. Hey, all right. Technology is great. <laughs> Um, so Still Andy, learning here. Turning that's, wheels are on. We all are. It's all good. It's all good. So I will just let you quickly introduce yourself and the company that you're from, but, and then um, I'll let, give you a chance to respond to the question that we just discussed briefly. Sure. Uh, yeah. Thanks for having me first, uh, Kevin. Uh, Stacy on IoT, and, and obviously your voice uh, has been in my head for, for a couple of years now, and it's a, and it's a big, and quite frankly, a big learning platform for us and a great way for us to to get insights across various industries, whether it's consumer or industrial. So thank you. Um, uh, I'm with 3M. Um, most of us know us for post-it notes, scotch tape, and of course N95s now. And uh, I'm in a, a business uh, called Filtreat. Uh, so we invented e electrostatic HVAC uh, air filters in 1991. And that's been something indoor air quality has been very passionate. Uh, we've been passionate about it even before people even knew to think about it, especially here in North America. Uh, and, and I've been uh, leading, uh, alongside one of my uh, colleagues, Patrick Heiner, been leading, uh, developing a, a connected platform uh, to transform Filtreat from, from a filter brand into an air quality management brand. And, and we're doing using IoT uh, to, to be able to connect right into the smart home. Uh, and so that's been my role the last couple of years, last two and a half years, hardware, software, integration, cloud and platform development, uh, again, internally across our, our different, uh, both business groups, as well as uh, say corporate platforms, and then external as it relates to development partners, both from a software and cloud standpoint, as well as uh, folks at Google and, and Amazon. And, and I was listening this morning, you know, uh, I love Ginger's uh, kind of uh, one plus one equals three. Uh, the smart home is really about uh, the sum of all of its parts, and, and that's really our, our mission is to bring more air quality awareness into into homes. Awesome, awesome. Um, so, what we were just discussing, if you want to chime in, sure. Um, what's the biggest challenge you have faced um, when it comes to uh, connected products? And we specifically kind of focused on um, privacy because sure. that seems to be, from a consumer standpoint. People want to share their data to get a better product, but yet 
don't want to share the data to give too much away. So what what have you experienced there? Uh, I've experienced what Matt has experienced. Uh, everything is challenging, right? I mean, there are multiple moving pieces in creating connected products, especially hardware, software. Uh, and, and the challenges are, are different than, you know, even 3M is historically used to. I mean, we're a material science company. So software and a, and a software, let's say, ongoing added value proposition to consumer communication uh, with consumers and, and you know, unearthing uh, problems that consumers or homeowners don't even know that they have. Uh, and so that education curve, I think, of, of trying to educate, you know, consumers on A, uh, what the value prop is and, and how we can help in, in ways that you've never thought of us being able to help before. And then B, to your point about data, data privacy and data security, you know, this is something uh, that we take incredibly seriously, just as I'm sure everybody else on the call, uh, but we're very sensitive about ensuring that we try to communicate to users that ultimately the data is theirs. Right? You, you, you own the device, it's your data, and, and our goal and our mission is to be able to use that data to improve the product or improve the user experience. And it's an, quite frankly, it's an everyday challenge and something that we talk about internally is how do we continue to communicate that the data that, that the, the user shares with us uh, is really intended to help us make the product experience better, make it smarter. Uh, I, again, Matt, you had a great example of, 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 you know, consumers not seeing your cloud costs. Uh, but ultimately, your cloud costs, like for you to improve, I can, I can improve the product over the, the product's, you know, life cycle. Um, but how do you communicate that and so that the consumer understands that what you're paying for or not paying for is adding value to the overall experience? So, you know, I think data privacy, really for us, it's a, it, we take it very, very seriously, but ultimately it's communicating and building the trust with the, the consumer and the user. Thankfully, we have a brand um, that, that is trusted, but, but this is a completely different kind of, uh, you know, experience that, that uh, you know, the smart home is bringing to, I think, all homeowners. And so uh, it's an everyday challenge and something that's on top of our mind. Yeah, it, it doesn't get more personal than, than home and home information. Right. So, Absolutely. yeah. Totally, totally understand. So I have some other questions to continue the discussion, but we already have like four queued up from the audience. And since I really want to hear what they are curious about, I'm going to queue up the first one. So let me bring in Rich and see if Rich can ask his question. I have brought him in, but I don't see him. I'm going to drop my video to see if that helps. And I can't. Oh, no. Hmm. Oh, no. All right. Let me see if I can figure that out. But in, in order to keep the conversation going, um, I'm curious. We talked about this briefly this morning, um, but I'd like to dig into it a little bit deeper. Uh, at this point, it's 2020. Do we see you as a collective group or even as just as individuals? Are IoT standards becoming less of a challenge for product design in the home? Or are we not there yet? And, and I'm, I know Connected Home Over IP hopes to fix this. I know some of you are, are involved, some of your companies are involved with, with CHIP, um, but I'd be curious to see where you think we are when it comes to standards. I can take a first stab at that. Um, from Silicon Labs, uh, supporting all the standards for the smart home, we get this question every day, right? Which technology should I base my new product on? And that is uh, probably still with the initiatives going on, still a, a, a huge challenge for the industry. Um, also, what do we have today and what will happen next year and a year from then? Uh, the lifetime of my product might be three, four years. How do I ensure that I, I, it, it stays relevant in two years when the consumers are in a different context? Um, so, so that is that is one of the biggest challenges still for the industry. Now, the project connected home over IP uh, uh, really is the first big uh, uh, initiative that brings all the the biggest industry players together, um, and uh, um, the prospects of that is is huge. But there's still also uh, uh, several technologies and building blocks in, involved in that. A, a, a big initiative. Um, so it's not going to solve everything uh, for the home, but but it's a very big, uh, good first step. So we we see, again, across a fairly broad range of 
of consumer products, what, what we see is everyone, um, everyone pretty much is a, a adopting um, Alexa and Google Home. Um, we're not seeing a huge uptick on smart things. We're seeing some, some home kit. Um, but the, you know, the interesting thing in terms of the state of where we are is all of these standards are evolving um, constantly. And right, and, and then if you, if you kind of take it one step further, when you think about the fact that you probably have a mobile app, it's probably on an Android device, it's probably on an iOS device, and those are evolving as well, and those standards are evolving. Um, I would say um, we have a long, long, long way to go to get to a point where it's easy for um, people building connected devices to say, yes, I'm, I'm playing as part of these ecosystems, and I'm future-proofed, and I'm well-protected. And I would, I would say probably 80% of our engineering time is directly or indirectly related to, to playing in that evolving ecosystem, whether it's you know, voice, UI, or, or other third-party services. And I can chime in here. I, as somebody who um, deals with a lot of different uh, uh, partners in the um, consumer ecosystem, Right now, it's really expensive for these partners to develop because there are so many different uh, protocols out there. And um, what it forces these device makers to do is have multiple SKUs for their products that are lightly differentiated, and it's expensive for them to maintain, to build and maintain. And I think that's really a problem for the industry. And a lot of times also, um, uh, there are hubs required as well that adds cost and those costs just get added on to the cons uh, to the consumer passed on to the consumer which raises the price overall of an already fairly expensive industry and so uh google's involvement in project connected home over ip in many ways is meant to try to help bring uh, some standardization so it reduces the burden on the device makers and lowers their costs and as those costs lower then the cost of the consumer can lower and it just opens up, we're hoping it will open, open up uh, consumer IT even more, or IoT even more broadly. And I think that's a, a, a big challenge that we have today. So, you know, Jonathan, you're right. Uh, Project Connected Home over IP isn't gonna solve everything, but I think it's going to solve, uh, hopefully going to solve a few of the um, more endemic issues that we have today in consumer IT or IoT that, uh um that are just continuing to sort of cost us out of the prices out of the industry or prices out of the market with uh consumers yeah i i'll piggyback on that and you know certainly we while we are you know we, we consider ourselves leaders in in filtration and our material science non-woven you know technology that traps and captures the particles from the air, that the connectivity and, and building that connectivity into the products is, from a regulation standpoint, is a very big challenge for us, both here in the U.S. as well as, as we think about global markets, because we're in China and we're in APAC and we're in India and, and we're in Australia. You know, we're, we, we stand to be able to, to, to be an air quality leader across the world, but the connectivity and the, and the standardization is is a challenge. And so we, we, we see ourselves as kind of trying to lead there, but also follow along kind of on the heels of what, Michelle, you were talking about, which is, you know, we, we look to yourselves and, and other, you know, big platforms or providers within the space to try to bring some standardization because mm -hmm. you're exactly right. You know, for us to 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 get into hardware, it just like just like Matt, or just like you know any uh, startup, while while components, you know, our our component costs continue to come down, sensors continue to co co come down, a lot of other of uh, costs that go into building a connected product. You talked about the bomb, and then you, you know, trying to communicate that value proposition to a to a user, and why why would I pay more for something that's connected? And and that uh, and the standardization, of course, as you're talking about, Michelle, I think we see as being very, very important because it does help us standardize not only product development, uh, but also mm -hmm. kind of solution development. Matt, you were talking in the cloud, uh, you know, building solutions like literally building solutions from the cloud and pushing out, you know, over the air firmware updates to 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 add more value to the product. That all has cost to it. So the more standardization from those we, you know, when we do look to you as, as, as leaders, we think is very, very important for us, again, to be consumer relevant, 
We have an infiltration yeah. uh, at that scale here in North America with the Filtreat brand and then and global markets under the 3M brand. But um, again, as we talk about building a solution set for the, the consumer and the homeowner, it's going to be very important. So we, we continue to look uh, for your leadership there. We, we think it's going to be great. <clears throat> and Matt, this is your chance to ask Michelle to get my June oven to work with my Google Home, by the way. We, so <laughs> full disclosure, Amazon's one of our investors. So we, we are Alexa only company right now, but we're, we're not restricted. I can say that we could build for Google Home. I think. Let's chat, Matt. <laughs> I, I, I think that just one of the, the big challenges with this, this industry, you know, kind of the, the different platform for connected smart home is that we haven't been able to solve this problem between iOS and Android to kind of have consistent user experiences across iOS and Android mm -hmm. after you know how many years of mobile into this are we? What, 2007, January, the iPhone was introduced, right? So it's been over a decade that we still can't figure that out. So I don't know that there's gonna be an easy path without investing a lot in design user experience and engineering to give best in class experiences for all these platforms. And so it's a very unsolved problem, I see, which is a bummer because I, I would love to be platform agnostic, but we've, we've had to make bets and choices so far. And, and that's a bummer. We're not on Google Home right now, which I know frustrates a lot of our customers. Well, in fairness, I'm not frustrated, but <laughs> I, I, I tend to review and use a lot of different devices and platforms and systems. So I'm switching all the time. So when I have something that works on one thing and then I, it doesn't on the other, but that's atypical, I think. That's atypical. So um, let me see if I can uh, bring in, I have three more people in the, from the audience. I'm thinking the first person just dropped. So I'm gonna try Daniel, let's see if this works. And there's Daniel, welcome. There you go, and hopefully you can hear me and see me all right. We can. Thanks, Kevin. And then I'm a big fan of the show, as I'm sure Stacy's told you. Um, so my name's Daniel Mineta. I'm from MD Networks. I, I also happen to be the marketing chair for Project Connect the Home Over IP. So I've been really enjoying this conversation for the past 10 minutes or so. Um, but I really have more of a personal question. So my question is, um, you know, we work with a lot of customers and partners building connected products. And I kind of group them into two categories. You know, companies that see connectivity as a, a feature, like we're just going to throw Bluetooth in this product as a premium option. And customers who are making, you know, connectivity part of their business model, part of their core value proposition, you know, part of their relationship with customers. And, you know, we see a lot of big differences between those types of companies. Like, you know, do they see, how do they see support? Do they still see it as a traditional cost center they're trying to minimize? Or to many of the points that you've all raised, do they realize that connected devices are, you know, a long-term two-way relationship with customers and are a core part of the product? So I'm curious for those of you who either are device vendors um, or who are platforms that work with device vendors, what are other major differences you're seeing between traditional product companies with just connected options or those that are like really building true connected products and businesses? I suppose the two, the two, um, the two big, big things we see are so way of working. When when um, companies really embrace connected products, um, connected product lifecycle, they think about a typically a software stream that they continue to develop, and then they intersect it with different hardware releases. Versus thinking of you know the pro the, the hardware product release being everything. Um, and then the other two, the other difference is how they think about support, which is ongoing, proactively, you know, going out to, um, you know, going out to Amazon reviews, going out to, you know, the app store, checking the feedback, making updates, getting into a regular cadence of updates. And then the, the third big difference we see is, is use of data. Usually there is a business model or a business case based around use of the data, which becomes front and center which is, is not the case um, if someone, if the, if the company is, is staying kind of more traditional, you know, traditional business model. I can chime in there with a, um, I think a real world example, Daniel, of some of the 
some of what we're seeing right now um, in the appliance industry. So a few years ago, we had, uh, connected appliances and there, you know, you would have, I won't name any of the specific names, but you might have a connected washer dryer or you'd have a connected oven and, um, or they might have one line that one product line that was their connected product line. What we're starting to see now is these major appliance manufacturers, they've invested in their cloud backend. They've inve invested in their service layer. Um, they've invested in their apps. Uh, and now they're like, well, wait, we just did all of this software investment, which for an appliance manufacturer, right? The software is a, is a big new lift for them. These are hardware guys. They don't necessarily know how to do software. So they had to spin up these whole software teams. And now they're looking at it. And this is, I think, more specific to appliance manufacturers, but they're like, wow, Wi-Fi chip is not that big a deal for my bomb cost, right? So I'm just going to go make everything connected. And I think that there's start. It's it's an interesting industry trend. I don't think we're going to see it across everything, but for those um, uh, for those appliance manufacturers who in the past might have been connected but not connect, not necessarily smart, um, and not you know not something that you could uh, um, control remotely, they are shifting uh, completely. And now they're figuring out uh, what is the data that we're gaining and what is the services that what are the services we can build on top of that? Because now we're saying we can have a whole connected kitchen or we can have a whole connected cleaning service that we provide. So how do we think about what is that holistic solution that in, can include more services on top of that that we can provide for a consumer? And I think that's a really interesting shift in the industry. And they've already got like a support infrastructure built up. So it's really how do we um, add more value to the consumer at minimal additional cost since we already had to invest in the software layer. So. Yeah, I think we, you know, 3M is a manufacturing company and uh, software and IoT is, is not, uh, you know, a competency. I'll give you an example of, you know, with Filtreat, we've been making non-connected filters for 25 years. You know, when we made the decision to, to make one connected, we we literally built that off of understanding how the customer shops our category and there are multiple pain points. What size mm -hmm. filter do I need? Where do I get it? When is it, when is it need to be changed? Is my home or my system different than, than anybody else's? And so it's to bring, let's say a better user experience to, you know, the filter management um, experience that we, we have today, but that also required us to think about, well, what else is the consumer looking for? How can we help the consumer or the homeowner, know better so they can do better um and, and i think a, a lot of our let's call it iot and software development and user experience uh we've been building a lot on the on the fly i mean these are these are features that we try to get insights so we try to get feedback from customers we've even had to set up let's say a, a, an additional layer of support um, so we have to think differently about how our customers are connected 24 7 in, in our business where typically, you know, you weren't connected with a filter. So it's, it's completely, I think, changed uh, over the course of the last couple of years, we've been, you know, supporting and, 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 and selling the, the smart air filter. And, and we're, we're looking to take more steps to advance, you know, devices, it, it, which can have a more proactive way of managing air quality in the home. You know, we really try to, to think through what is the use case, the user story, and how will this connect it, right? How, what should we prioritize to connect that will bring more value um, to the customer and to the user of our products, whether it's a filter or whether it's a device or whether it's integrating into the smart home and using third-party platforms like IF to just make it easier for you as the consumer if you're using something that we don't necessarily make, humidifier, dehumidifier, but still impacts the, the value prop of managing air in your home. We need to be able to make that accessible for you. So I, I think there's a lot of, again, and we, we, we're we learning a lot as, as we go. And I think that, again, thankfully, uh, there are industry partners that, that are trying to trying to make it easier, right? Trying to be more helpful in the home. And, you know, we're, we're, we're trying to follow on that and, and, and make sure that we're connected in the, in the right ways, as well as providing the right support. I think that's a big one, too. I want to come with a, a couple of recommendations. So if you... Uh... If you're totally new to IoT and you have an existing product that's not connected and sort of the connectivity comes as an afterthought. Um, from Silicon Labs, we advise those types of customers to partner up with people who have experience, with, with partners who have experience 
taking a connected product to the market because it, once you're done with, with developing and producing and you, you have your product ready in your hand, that's when your IoT journey really starts. Mm -hmm. um, you're not at the end of the journey. You're at the journey when you get to that point. Um, an example is with those types of customers that uh, uh, they end up, they're just about to come out of production and they're like, oh, we need to certify. And then uh, the wireless certifications or the ecosystem certifications then takes on a few extra months. Whereas if you have IoT at the core, you know that you need to plan for certification in the beginning, even before you start making your development and such and so forth. So, so there's very different support models uh, whether you're new to IoT or whether you're an experienced player. And we, as a technology provider, we highly recommend you, if you are new, that you partner up with somebody who has experience in practice. Awesome. Daniel, I hope that you got a wealth of information out of that one question. I have two other people in here, so I'd like to see if I can tuck their questions in here, if that's fine. Thank you. Thank you. All right, let's see if Sandy is still here. He is not. Let's try Chuck. It's the only other one I have. Oh, here he comes. Although my uh, camera is looking somewhere and I'm talking somewhere else, but that's, that's fine. That's all right. That's all right. Um, my, my one quick question to all of you, we keep talking about data and privacy. And I have always looked, wondered that question because in my mind, Data, most of the data, uh, give, give, or, give or take a few points, but 98% uh, of the data is useless. What's, what's useful is that one or 2% of key information. So my question is, why are you sending all that data to be churned where there is nothing? So my question has always been, process the data at the end node itself completely. Don't send anything to manufacturer or anybody and only when there is an exception. An exception might be a burglar came in. That's an exception. You're, uh, uh, you know, uh, as Matt was talking about, now instead of having a, uh, uh, you have a full uh, uh, new different, uh, uh, I suppose, food product inside. Those are the exceptions which, and, and where, I'm, where, where I'm going with this is, you are putting a lot more intelligence into the end node itself so it can make the judgment, and in the hierarchy of data, information, knowledge, and wisdom, you are keeping most of it. So that's point number one. And number two is why are people not building, if you want to call it an anonymizer server, so you're not attaching name people, their locations, or anything, but you get what the data you need without knowing who it is coming from. So those are my two points that if, uh, if people would want to address, I would appreciate it. Great questions. And I just want to say, technically, we're done in about three minutes. So if any of the <laughs> panelists have to drop off, that's fine. But I'll keep this going for a little bit longer yet. So I, I can answer the first question. And I think just, you know, for, for us, we're, we're a small company, about 50 people. And for, for us, when we launched this product, this type of product had never existed before. There was no one on the team that said like, oh yeah, there were these best practices from this oven, this smart oven I used to make and work on. And so I think in the early days, we want to ingest and pick up as much data as possible. And then as we start to see what's actually useful and what actually brings value, then we can kind of start to be more smart and more intelligent about what we're taking. Uh, and then start doing things like sampling. And again, a top reason for doing this is actually cost. So there's a lot of, it's very expensive to take everything. But in the early days of our company, we didn't know what would be useful. It was very, very valuable. And we've been able to make very important product decisions by having everything. So an example, our Gen 1 product had a weight scale on it. And we looked at the data, no one used the weight scale. Like it was a very, very small percentage of customers that used that. And it was an expensive item on our bomb. And so we were able for the Gen 2 product to remove that feature based on checking on the usage patterns because we had that data. And we've gotten smarter and smarter about sampling, but I think in the early days, as just as a connected product, until you figure out what's useful to make the product better, you want to ingest as much as possible. Matt, just uh, one thing that I just wanted to address. 
I also heard everybody talking cost, but in a, in a family of uh, four people at my home, every two years we pay $950 for an iPhone that keeps on changing. While the devices that we are talking about here are, you know, I have a six or seven hundred fifty thousand dollar home, and 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 I it, it baffles me when people say, "Oh, these devices are expensive," because some of these devices have a life of five to seven years, maybe ten years, and sometimes even more. So uh, why are we talking cost, not the value? And and we can always find a business model to be able to find how to how to take care of the cost. That means you can say every three years, uh, you know, pay just me five ninety five and keep on paying for three years so you don't feel that, that CapEx cost up front. But there are business models. So that also intrigues me, by the way. That was, I, sorry, I sorry to take that diversion, but I keep hearing cost and I feel like, gosh, my kids want $950 or $850 latest and greatest iPhone 11. I have no problem in one shot I write the check but to have a $200 super duper smart camera, I'm saying, oh my God, what's the cost? So sorry for yeah. the side comment. But no, it's, it's a good side comment. <laughs> I think it's, 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 a, it's a big challenge. You know, from, from us, our Gen 1 product costs $1,500. Our, our current product, which are sold out of, the entry level price is $499. And the market size for a $1,500 countertop oven, toaster oven, smart product, which is, we were the first in the category, was very, very small. Our customers yeah. loved it, but kind of there is this, this kind of really challenging, you know, you're introducing something totally new. So it's okay that it's expensive, but it's a small set of early adopters that are willing to get there. And so there is this big challenge, but I, I agree with you. The iPhone has proven that it's worth it year over year. Most people on this chat probably don't have a smart oven yet. And if they don't have a June, that's probably not adding much value to their life. And so it's, it's a very hard business challenge. Thank you, Sandy, so much for the question. I'm just going to move on for a second here. And let's see. I don't think I have any other questions. Does anybody need to drop? We can certainly drop. Technically, we're done. But if there's, if you want to wrap up and say what's the best piece of advice you might want to give somebody who's starting a connected product other than don't do it, um, we can go around the room and, and close up with that. I want to say do it. I, I think uh, we're talking about a lot of uh, barriers and challenges, uh, but reality is that the smart home space is thriving more than ever. Uh, we have really the wind in our backs, all of us who are engaged in it. Um, the consumer wants more smart home. Uh, we see that in any region, across any device type, across any type of, of customer. Um, and um, I want to leave the audience with, uh, as my colleague Matt, he mentioned, joining the Works With conference, where we'll have the, the, the hands-on training to connect with all the different smart home ecosystems um, in September. So that's what I, I want to leave with a plug on. Any other last minute advice for people? Yeah. I'd say definitely do it. Um, we're seeing, um, we look at same device sales, same connected device sales year on year on year based on the data we have. Um, and we got, you know, small for Google, we've only got a couple of million devices on the platform, but um, we basically see same device connected device sales doubling year on year and have done for the last few years. So, you know, connected device sales are on the way up. I would say I forget who made the point, but the point about um, making once you release that first connected product, that's when your journey starts and plan and prepare for that would be my, would be my advice. I'll, yeah. I'll chime in as somebody who- Go oh, ahead, go ahead. Any, just somebody who runs an ecosystem. Um, totally agree, like the, the space is absolutely growing. We're seeing it as well, but make sure you're solving a real customer pain point. And before you start investing a lot of money in your hardware development, um, make sure you validated that with users. I see a lot of products today that aren't really solving real problems for consumers. Um, there's sort of a, as we say, a vitamin as opposed to a painkiller. The things that do really well are the things that, um, that solve real problems for people today. Um, just because it's connected doesn't mean it's better. 
So figure out what that core value proposition is. I know Matt spent a lot of time on this with June, right? To figure out how do we how do we make this, this whole experience better, faster, easier uh, for consumers. Get there before you start really diving in and spending a bunch of money on hardware. And to, to tackle onto that, like, you know, everyone's saying, do it, do it. I could be the one that does the opposite, just don't do it. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but I'll, I'll put an asterisk on that. Though. Like I'm, I'm having the most fun I've ever had work, working on June. It's passionate about food, technology, connected parts, but it's so expensive. Like, and there are so many companies that have run out of money and so many venture capital mm -hmm. firms that say, I will never fund hardware again. And it's really, really hard. And so I would try and be clever about how you do something because just saying like, Hey, I'm going to make a, I know a keynote presentation and go raise a bunch of money and it's going to be great for B2C. It's almost impossible right now. I, I hate to be that like negative voice because I'm such an optimist in general, but it's really, really, really hard. And so you need to figure out how you can hack it, how you can convince Michelle's team to help pay for something or help with something. <laughs> and, you know, a lot of you know, B2B optimizations, and then maybe you could try consumer later, but it's really, really hard to get started and actually get the capital to do anything interesting in, in B2C. Today. And I don't know if we were starting June today, I don't know that I would be able to do our initial fundraise, right? We kind of, there was the excitement of Nest in those early days. Not every venture capitalist had lost money back then. And now almost every venture capitalist has lost money in hardware <laughs> since then. And it, some have made money too, but it's, it, it's a challenge. Yeah, I, you know, for, for us, it's, we, we see ourselves uh, uh, in connect, like our connect, we connected solutions. We're our own little, small little business group, kind of, we're, we're this little startup within the company. And, um, you, you know, it, I think for, for us, and I would say to, to piggyback on Matt is, you know, yeah, do it, but understand that it is going to be a, a, a significant lift in uh, cost structure. So there's going to have to be an investment made, right? So for us, we're, we're asking multiple different, you know, uh, groups of leadership for a significant investment to build, you know, the platform, which has to be centered around what Michelle said. Yeah, you're really solving a, a true customer need. And maybe they don't need, know that they need it. But, you you know, it, it's, it's in your core competency to continue to, and I think, it, uh, invest in understanding how the consumer is using the product. And I think this iterative, you know, this has been a mindset shift. The biggest thing I think for us has been a mindset shift away from say uh, a one-time sale to continual product improvement to different business models. Uh, but then ultimately, you know, the shift in mindset for key performance indicators, you know, to get this off the ground and get adoption and, and hear the feedback from those early adopters you talked about, Matt, and be able to continue to iterate out in front of the next couple generations. You know, if you don't have that kind of mindset, which is different for, for has been for us, it's going to be a really, really big uphill challenge, being willing to be yeah. agile and continually try to improve. So I was going to give Jonathan the last word, but I see Stacy joined us. So can, can he still have the last word? Um, can he have the penultimate word and I'll do the last word? That works for me. Well, I already, I already gave my, my input on this one, so I, I feel like some, someone else should have it. I don't actually have I, I don't have a last word on this. I wanted to pop in to thank everyone for participating. I was I want to give all of y'all a big hug because I was not able to be, you know, part of your sessions. So I'm like, oh. Uh, but I also wanted to. Are are you wrapping up, Kevin? Actually, we are we are all set. I and and I appreciate okay. everybody for staying past our time. It just, it was a good conversation. We had mm -hmm. some good audience questions as well. So thank you very much, guys. Appreciate it. Thanks so for having everybody. Us so yeah. Thank you. And then make sure I, I want to thank our sponsors, Ayla Networks, Silicon Labs and Works With, and also Barry. So anybody who wants to stick around, the networking and expo floors will be open until noon PT. Everyone else can, you know, go make friends, do that sort of thing. And thank everybody. Thank y'all so much for being here and everyone for attending. <laughs>